Welcome to part two of the AP Chemistry presentation on periodic properties. You'll need the same materials you needed for the previous part. And we're still following the same basic framework, linking, uh, linking the periodic properties back to electron configurations and effective nuclear charge. For this portion of the presentation, we're going to be focusing on the ionic radius, which we kind of skipped over in the last uh, presentation, and how all of the things we've learned, including uh, ionic radius, affect the activity or nobility, or otherwise known as reactivity, of an element. Okay, so let's look at the differences between ionic and atomic radius. The obvious difference is in the definition. Ionic radius is the radius of an ion. Atomic radius is the radius of a neutrally charged atom. Now, looking at the factors that determine each of these, ionic radius is determined by all the factors that determine atomic radius. And those are, as we went through in great detail in the previous presentation, effective nuclear, uh, nuclear charge and highest principal quantum number. The addition or removal of electrons also affects the radius. So remember to go from a neutrally charged atom to an ion, you need to add or remove some electrons. Shouldn't be too surprising that removing electrons makes the atomic radius much larger than the ionic radius. In other words, you take away electrons, you make the thing smaller. Adding electrons makes the ionic radius much larger than the atomic radius. In other words, you put electrons in, the thing gets bigger. Let's look at the fundamental reasons why, in terms of effective nuclear charge, highest principal quantum number, electron configurations, those sort of fundamental explanations. All right, so for a cation, remember cations are the positively charged guys, electrons are lost from the highest energy level, the orbital with the highest principal quantum number. Now typically, a cation has lost all of the electrons from its, from its highest energy level. So if you compare a sodium uh, atom to a sodium ion, you notice the difference in the electron configurations is the 3s1 electrons. In order to become the sodium ion, you lose that 3s1 electron, and the 3s1 electron is the only electron that had a principal quantum number of 3. All the, these other guys have principal quantum numbers of 1 and 2. So, in going from sodium, metal, to sodium ions, the highest principal quantum number decreases by 1. That's a key fact. Decreasing the principal quantum number drastically decreases the radius. The radius of the cation is much smaller than the radius of the atom, and the ionic radius of cations follow the same periodic trends as atoms. In other words, if you want to compare one cation to another, you're pretty much looking at the same logic that you use to get uh, to compare one atom to another. Okay, so the radius of cations is smaller because you've decreased the highest principal quantum number. Now let's look at anions. These are the negatively charged guys. To make an anion, electrons are added until the atom has a full s and p orbitals. So if you look at oxygen, oxygen has six valence electrons, but the oxide ion, that is the oxygen ion with a negative 2 charge, has a full 8 electrons in its highest, uh, in its valence electron. In other words, it's isoelectronic with um, neon. Isoelectronic just means same electron configuration, same number of electrons. So, in achieving full s and p orbitals, octet, in other words, an octet, the orbitals change shape to get bigger. The radius of an anion is much larger than the radius of the atom, and the radius of anions follow the same periodic trends as the radii of, atom, uh, of atoms. Looking at this in uh, pictorial form, we have what are, uh, we basically have the first few 
periods of the of the periodic table laid out here the gray spheres or the gray hemispheres are neutrally charged atoms the pink hemispheres are the ions for that atom and the blue hemispheres are also ions except these are negatively charged at, uh, ions and so if you want to look at periodic trends uh, if you want to see the principles that we went over here, uh, for example, look at lithium. Neutrally charged lithium has a radius of 1.34 angstroms. The lithium ion has a radius of 0 0.90 angstroms. So the lithium ion is much smaller than the lithium atom. Similar, uh, we still have the same basic... Uh, periodic trends in positively charged atoms, that is, increasing principal quantum numbers as we move downwards, increasing ionic radii as we move downwards, increasing effective nuclear charge as we move to the right, and increasing ionic radius as we move to the left. So that means that the highest atomic, uh, positively charged atomic radius in this group is going to be the rubidium ion. The, you can also see the difference between atomic radii and the radii of the corresponding anion by looking at things like oxygen here. Oxygen atoms have a radius of 0.73, whereas the oxygen oxide ion has a radius of 1.26. So you have this big increase in atomic radius as you go from the neutrally charged atom to the negatively charged ion. And as with atoms, as you go down a column of ions, you get bigger as you move from right to left you also get bigger as long as you're char comparing negatively charged ions to other negatively charged ions. Okay, here are some practice problems for you to Im apply the uh, principles you've just learned. Just to let you know, a little bit of a hint, when you're comparing neutrally charged ions, uh, neutrally charged atoms and ions, I find it much easier to work out the trends of the neutrally charged atoms first and then figure out how the ions fit within that trend. Also, within this second list, there is, uh, it's, there's a couple rather difficult comparisons. If you can work them out, great. If not, don't. Please pause the video now. I'll resume narration in five seconds. Okay, I hope you've had some time to figure these out as best you can. Let's go over the solutions now. Like I said earlier, compare the neutrally charged atoms first. And so to compare magnesium and sulfur, magnesium is going to be the larger atom. And that's because, first of all, they have the same energy level, the same highest principal quantum number. So that's not going to be a factor in the comparison. What causes the difference is the effective nuclear charge. Magnesium has the lower effective nuclear charge. That makes it the bigger atom. From there, figuring out the ion sizes is pretty easy. Remember that when you go from neutral to ion, you get a big change, a big increase if you're going to a negative ion and a big decrease if you're going to a uh, positive ion. So not surprisingly, the sulfide ion is going to be the largest and the magnesium ion is going to be the smallest. Okay, looking at calcium, iodine, the calcium ion, the iodide ion, and xenon. Let's start with the easy comparison first. If you look at iodine and xenon, they are right next to each other in the periodic table. So that means uh, 
that means that there's going to be a difference only in the effective nuclear charge. Again, smaller effective nuclear charge means larger radius. That makes iodine larger than xenon. Okay, probably the hardest part of this is figuring out where the calcium metal goes in this mixture here. And it actually goes right there. The reason this is difficult is because you have two conflicting trends here. Con trend number one is the decrease in energy level. And that means that you should get a smaller atom. But there is also a decrease in the effective nuclear charge, which means you should get a larger atom. So the question is not which trends you're looking at, but which trend is more effective, which trend has a stronger effect on the atomic radius. And if you look at where calcium is versus where iodine is on the periodic table, you'll see that they are very far apart, which kind of is masked by this difference in effective nuclear charge. It's only a difference of three in terms of effective nuclear charge, but in terms of the total number of electrons and the total number of protons, iodine has a heck of a lot more of both that makes it uh, significantly larger than calcium. Okay, the calcium ion, uh, well, let's actually see what all we've got here. Oh yeah, iodine, okay, so iodine and calcium, Hard to figure out. Iodide should be easy to figure out. Iodide is uh, going from iodine to iodide causes a large increase in radius, larger than the somewhat conflicting trends you would have gotten out of the calcium comparison. The calcium is uh, the smallest one, and you could say that it's smallest just because it's uh, just because it's the positively charged ion. But that's actually kind of a weak argument. Honestly, the best way to do this is to compare calcium, both calcium and xenon, to argon. Okay, in other words, move on one axis of the periodic table at a time. The calcium ion is isoelectronic with argon. In other words, it's got the same number of electrons as argon, but it has more protons, and that makes the calcium ion smaller than argon. Now, if you compare argon and xenon, those are in the same, the same uh, family, the same group in the periodic table. Xenon is lower down, which makes it bigger. So, calcium is smaller than argon, xenon is bigger than argon, therefore, the calcium ion is smaller than the xenon atom. And that's the best way to make this argument. OK, uh, let's look at the periodic properties in uh, uh, re review periodic properties in attraction versus uh, and how that relates to reduction versus oxidation. So the effective nuclear charge and atomic radius determine the attraction of the valence electrons to the nucleus. Higher effective nuclear charge gives you strong attraction. Low atomic radius also gives you strong attraction. That means that strong attraction, oh, and strong attraction also means strong reduction potential. In other words, a strong tendency to pull electrons off of neighboring atoms. And so this is why nonmetals reduce and nonmetals become reactive with higher, uh, more reactive with higher effective nuclear charge and lower atomic radii. It's because the attraction gets stronger as you follow these periodic trends. And incidentally, the periodic trends of higher effective nuclear charge and lower atomic radius for non reactive nonmetals ends around fluorine. So the closer you are to fluorine, the more reactive your nonmetals are. OK, we can apply the reverse of this logic for oxidation. That is the process of losing electrons. Low effective nuclear charge means you get weak attraction of the valence electrons to the nucleus. Similarly, high atomic radius also means weak attraction. The weaker your attraction, the stronger your oxidation potential. In other words, the weaker your attraction, the, strong, the more likely 
an atom is to lose electrons. The process of losing electrons is called oxidation, and so this explains why metals oxidize. Also, metals become more reactive with lower effective nuclear charge and higher atomic radii, and if you look at where those two trends converge, they converge somewhere around cesium. Yes, technically they converge around francium, but given the half-life of francium is exceedingly short, you will never encounter a francium atom ever. Okay, let's summarize what I just said in a slightly more visual format. If this is the periodic table here in, I guess that would be gold or maybe kind of orange. Anyway, your effective nuclear charge increases as you move to the right. That means your attraction increases as you move to the right, which means that your metals get more active as you move to the left. Remember, less attraction means more reactive metals. Your principal quantum number increases as you go down. In increasing principal quantum number gives you higher atomic radius. Higher atomic radius gives you less attraction, so that means you get more reactive metals as you go downwards. These two trends converge somewhere around here at cesium. So, closer to cesium, means more reactive. All right, so here's a summary of the same trends, except now we're talking about nonmetals. Nonmetals follow the exact opposite trends of reactivity, and that's because metals give away electrons, they oxidize, whereas nonmetals receive electrons, they reduce. So, effective nuclear charge increases as you move to the right, that means activity increases, or reactivity if you prefer, increases as you move to the right. Quantum numbers, principal quantum numbers increase as you move downwards. That means that reactivity of nonmetals increases as you move upwards. To give you the full logic, higher effective nuclear charge means stronger attraction. Stronger attraction means more likely to reduce, more likely to reduce means increasing reactivity for a nonmetal. Higher principal quantum number means higher atomic radius. Higher atomic radius means less, attrac less attraction. Less attraction means less likely to react. In other words, your reactivity decreases as you go down. Reverse that logic, your reactivity will increase as you go up. Now, given that the noble gases basically don't react with anything, you'll find the most reactive nonmetal right here. In other words, fluorine is the most reactive nonmetal. Okay, so reactivity of metals increases as you go down a group, increases as you go to the left in a period. That means that cesium, or if you want to be really particular, francium, is the most reactive metal. For nonmetals, it increases as you go up a group and as you go to the right in a period, except for the noble gases, and that means that fluorine is the most reactive nonmetal. Now these simple periodic trends, you know, closer to cesium, more reactive metals, closer to fluorine, more reactive nonmetals, those are okay, they're good enough to get you past multiple choice problems, but they will absolutely get you zero credit on a free response problem. On a free response problem, if you're asked to explain the reasons for reactivity, you need to be able to explain this in terms of effective nuclear charge and atomic radius. All right, here are some practice problems, but before you get those practice problems, you need to know how reactivity affects behavior in simple redox reactions. These are the single replacement reactions we talked about uh, in previous chapters. So if you look at a single replacement reaction where you replace the cation, which is in this case B, with something else, which would by process of elimination have to be either hydrogen or a metal. So uh, let's assume it's a metal. If you have an elemental metal, 
and another metal that's in an ionic compound, then in order for this reaction to actually happen, the elemental metal has to be more reactive than the metal that is an ion. In other words, in order to get this reaction happening, A has to be closer to cesium than B is. If that's not true, then you get no reaction. You can also apply the patterns of reactivity to single replacement reactions of nonmetals. Remember, we can take the, uh, a nonmetal ion and a nonmetal element and have a reaction happen where the nonmetal element goes into the ionic compound, and at the same time, the nonmetal ion becomes a nonmetal element. But this will only happen if the nonmetal element, in this case Y, is more reactive than the ionic element. So, generally speaking, the thing that starts as an element has to be more reactive than the thing that starts as an ion, otherwise you get no reaction. So, apply that basic principle to these five examples. I'll resume narration in five seconds. Please pause the video now. Okay, let's go over these answers. Calcium plus magnesium chloride, that means that the calcium could potentially replace the magnesium. Looking at a periodic table, calcium is lower in the periodic table. That makes it more reactive, so calcium will replace magnesium to give you calcium chloride plus magnesium metal. By the way, these are not balanced reactions, or I'm not going to present balanced reactions for all of these answers. Okay, between sodium iodide and chlorine gas, the chlorine could potentially replace the iodine. They, that, in other words, the nonmetal here could replace the nonmetal there. Look at the periodic table. Chlorine is higher in the halogen group than iodine is. That means it's more reactive. Remember, uh, the trends of reactivity are opposites for metals and nonmetals. Metals get more reactive as you go downwards. Nonmetals get more reactive as you go upwards. So chlorine will replace iodine. You'll end up with sodium chloride and iodine, either aqueous or solid, depending on the circumstances. Calcium fluoride plus beryllium. Beryllium's the metal right above magnesium. So uh, since beryllium is above calcium, the beryllium is less reactive than calcium. It is more noble, and therefore it will not replace calcium. We will get no reaction out of this because we are trying to uh, react a less reactive element with a more reactive ionic compound, and that just causes no reaction. Same basic uh, facts are true for copper and iron 3 oxide. Copper is farther away from cesium. Iron is closer to cesium. That means that iron is more reactive. Copper is less reactive, or you could say more noble. And so we will get no reaction. If copper metal plus iron oxide doesn't react, that means that iron metal plus copper oxide should react, and indeed it does. But to walk you through the full logic here, iron is closer to cesium. That means it has a lower effective nuclear charge. The lower effective nuclear charge means less attraction of its valence electrons to the, uh, to the nucleus. That makes it more likely to oxidize, and hence it undergoes oxidation, copper undergoes reduction, and you end up with one of two possible results. Either copper plus iron 3 oxide or copper plus iron 2 oxide. Either one is acceptable, iron 2 oxide or iron 3 oxide. Uh, to know specifically what you get would require more information than you're given here. This slide concludes the second of the three parts for the periodic properties presentation.